get at Tech Transfer all the time is when do I know when it's time to super? Um, so we've got a couple hives open today and we're going to show you exactly what to look for when you want to be putting extra boxes on your hive. Um, so it's important to always make sure your bees have enough space. If they don't have enough space for the queen to lay her brood and for the bees to store excess resources like nectar and pollen, then they're going to swarm. And swarms are natural. Um, it's the, the natural way that beehives split and reproduce in the wild, but it's a better idea to keep your swarms under control and stop it from happening wherever possible. Um, so you want to make sure that your bees have space so they never get cramped up and never want to leave. So this hive that's open right now, it's a great example of when it's time to super. So you can look and see the, the spaces in between uh, the frames are all full of bees. All 10 frames are full of bees. Anytime your colony gets strong enough to fill up eight to 10 frames of bees like this, you wanna put an extra box on, whether that's a super or an extra brood chamber. So you wanna make sure they've got something like that um, when they get this strong. So you can see here, the uh, there's not much burr comb or anything on top of the frames. I have gone and uh, scraped all the top bars down. So it's in perfect condition to set my queen excluder on and then we'll put an extra box right on top of that. This one over here, it's been left a little too long. Um, so when your bees run out of space before swarming, they'll start filling up every single centimeter of space in the hive with burr comb and with honey and they won't move all that much but you can see every single frame has burr comb and honey and drone brood commonly stacked on top of it so this hive was allowed to get a little too strong before we added extra space so now it's a mess um, it's a solvable mess though so if you do go into your hives and see this um, all you have to do is scrape all of that off um, into a pile so you don't leave it in your yard and you can take it away and put it in the garbage, but just scrape all of that off and add space right away. It's gonna be messy when it gets to this point, um, so just do your best, do what you can. Um, try to be gentle. You can use a smoker to get the bees away and gently run your hive tool across the hive bars or hive top bars and get the wax off that way um, and just be gentle trying not to squish as many bees as possible um, the other thing you want to be careful of when you're doing this is to make sure you're not going to damage your queen so your queen is likely down in the bottom not up here but she could be you want to make sure you're protecting your queen so if it's possible to go through before you scrape down your top bars and find your queen and make sure she's not going to get squished or, or disrupted by, by any of this activity, then that's a, a, better, uh, a better thing to do. Make sure you, she's nice and safe before you start scraping. Um, and then you don't have to throw all of this out, so this is actually great um, for charcuterie boards and, and parties and snacks in the bee yard. Um, so you can snack on this while you work. You don't have to just toss it in the garbage. Top supering versus bottom supering. Um, so this is a very common question. Should I put my supers on top? and stack new ones on top, or should I put new supers on the bottom underneath my full supers? Ultimately, it's gonna come down to your preference as a beekeeper, um, but here are the benefits of each method. So for top supering, all you have to do is take off your lid and crack your inner cover and look to see if the very top box is full. If it's full and it's time for another super, Then you pop another super on top, even out the frames, and close it back up. Nice and easy. So this is a great method if you do your supering apart from your inspections. It doesn't require lifting supers off and putting them back on again. You're just always putting the lightest one right on top. Uh, and you can uh, see if they need it by how full the, the very top box is. With bottom supering, you're gonna take your full supers off before you put the empty one on. So that's the full super, it's time for another one, and you're gonna put the empty one right above the brood chamber, 
and put the full one on top. So the benefit of bottom supering is that the bees and honey up top pull more bees into that empty super um, and get them filling it out a little bit faster. Um, if you're doing your supering at the same time as your inspections and you're gonna be lifting your supers off anyway to get into that brood chamber, um, then bottom supering is a, is a great way to, to do it. You always want to make sure that your frames are evenly spaced in the super, otherwise the bees will start to draw out the wax all funky. Um, it'll make it harder to extract the honey, it'll make it harder to position your supers, it'll just be a big pain overall. So make sure that you are straightening out your frames and making sure that they're evenly spaced within the honey super. When we're going through and doing inspections at this time of year, something you want to keep in mind all of the time is making sure that your colonies are not trying to swarm. Um, so the first step of doing this is making sure that you have a queen in there, she's healthy and she's laying really well. You don't necessarily have to find the queen every single time you do an inspection. It is enough just to find eggs. So finding eggs can be pretty tricky when you're first uh, starting in beekeeping. Um, they're very hard to see. So it's all about learning how to tilt the frame and looking into the bottom of the cell to find that little egg, the little grain of rice at the bottom of the cell and making sure that there's plenty of them in the, in the hive. So on overcast days, this can be pretty tricky to spot. Even on sunny days, sometimes it's a little harder. So I like to bring a little pen light into the field with me and you can shine it down into the cells and it makes the eggs a lot easier to find. If you don't have a pen light, even using the flashlight on your cell phone will work. Just something to light up the bottom of those cells so you can see what's in there. Um, so as you're going through each frame, you're checking for eggs, you're making sure you're looking out for the queen. You also want to check for signs of swarm cells. So the beginning signs of swarm cells are these little things right here. We call them queen cups. So bees will um, make these all over the colony, all throughout the frames, all the time in, at, at this time of year and, and most times of year really. Um, having queen cups like this in your colony doesn't mean anything. All bees will build it just so they're ready to go if they ever have to be. But you do want to make sure you, you look in them. So either tilt the frame and look down inside of them or just break them apart just like that so you can see if they've laid an egg. So the queen cups themselves, like I said, doesn't mean anything that they're in there. It's just another wax structure. But as soon as the queen lays an egg in one of these, it means they're thinking about swarming. So you wanna make sure if you find an egg in there, you're, you're going through your frames really carefully to find any other uh, queen cups with eggs in and tearing those down uh, to shut the bees down uh, when they're trying to swarm like that. This is the next stage, which is an uncapped queen cell. You can see a larva on a bed of royal jelly. The queen is developing and the workers are drawing out the cell, which they'll cap over before she pupates. So going through the hive, I found some open queen cells. So I'm gonna be shaking all these bees out so that I have better visibility on the frame um, to make sure that there are no more queen cells. And if I find them, I'll tear them down because I have the queen right here. It's tucked away.
gonna show you right now is the final stage of queen cells, and that's an emerged queen cell. So if you look here, it's a nice big queen cell, and at the bottom, the edges are ripped evenly around in a perfect circle, um, so the queen would have chewed herself out there, flipped the lid open, and she would have crawled out. So, that, so that's what we're seeing right there. On the other side of this frame, mm -hmm is a capped queen cell. So you can see this one here. We'll show it upside down for you. So that has not emerged yet. There's likely a queen inside of there still developing. Um, so seeing both of these things in the colony, it means uh, they've likely already swarmed. I haven't seen any eggs. The queen, the original queen, isn't in here yet. Um, so with this emerged cell, there's likely a virgin running around and uh, she'll be making her way through the colony and tearing down any of these existing cells. Um, so it's too late to save this colony from swarming. They're already well on their way. Um, and I can tell by the population, they've, they've already left. Oh, it is also, oh, that's sneaky. Oh, it was emerged? Ooh, yeah. So this cell that I thought was capped, it's actually an emerged cell as well. So you can see here, the cap was just sitting tightly on but this lid has been lifted. The queen and the bees have chewed that circle and lifted the top and she's emerged from that cell. So that cell is empty um, and it means there's another virgin running around this colony. So at this point, this colony just needs some time to sort itself out. The virgins are gonna go through and fight and uh, until only one remains and then that one is gonna go on a mating flight, get mated and come back to this colony to be the new mated laying queen. There's nothing you can do at this point, um, so I'm just going to close it up and come check back in two weeks or so to see how they're doing. Ants. Gross. Uh, this is something that beekeepers will commonly see in their hives. Um, of course, bees aren't the only ones who love living in these hive boxes. There's lots of other critters that make their home here. And you can see there's a colony of ants who have really made themselves at home. So people ask all the time, because this is so common to see, do the ants actually bother the bees? And the answer is no. This doesn't bother the bees at all. It's more of a hassle for the beekeeper uh, because when you're, you're ripping off your equipment, you're touching your inner cover, the ants are gonna get all over your hands. Um, these ones don't seem to bother me too much, um, but some of them start to bite you and that's not great. Um, so you can get rid of them uh, with a handful of grass. Some people say cinnamon works for ants. Um, you can put as much effort into getting rid of them as you'd like as the beekeeper. Just know that your bees don't have a problem with them. It's, it's all about how you wanna work in your hives. So when you're trying to get rid of ants, you don't want to use any sort of chemical, any ant spray, that's going to kill your bees as fast as it kills the ants. Um, same, you never want to put any sort of mothball or other chemical control in your hives to try to control these other critters because anything like that is going to in, uh, impact your bees as well. So we're in the field today and we're gonna practice marking drones with a paint marker. Um, so when you buy a queen, chances are she'll come with a, a colored mark on her thorax and that corresponds to her age. And they're not born with that mark. The mark is put there by the beekeeper and it's a great thing to be able to pick up your queens and mark them. Um, it makes them easier to find when you're looking for them in the colony um, and it also allows you to track your queens better and you know if, if she swarmed, if it's a new queen or if it's the same queen that was in there before. Um, so when people are just getting started marking their queens, we definitely recommend not starting with the queen right off the bat, but start with drones. So drones are a lot less intimidating to start with. They're a little bigger and easier to pick up, so they're easier to, to get your fingers around when you're just starting. Um, learning how to pick bees up. Um, they also have no stinger, so they can be a lot gentler with you. If you fumble them around a little bit, you're not gonna worry about getting stung. Um, so avoid the workers, avoid the queen, just to make her safe, but practice on the drones. Wanna make sure you're picking her up by her thorax, by the middle part. Um, you wanna avoid picking any bee up by the abdomen because the abdomen's sensitive, so you don't wanna pick her up by that and squish her or squish him. Um, the thorax is rigid, it can take a firmer grip, so you can pick them up and hold them firmly without them 
flying away and, and without squishing him. So once you get a good grip there, you want the, the top of the thorax to be exposed. And then with your marker, just add a little dot to its back, just like that. Um, so we do this at Tech Transfer when people are learning how to, how to mark bees, but it's also a great thing to do when you're testing out new markers. Um, we're not sure how the, the paint is gonna come out, so it's always good to practice on something before you do it on your queen. Um, practice on bees and also practice on containers just to get a good sense of how much. You can see this one, it's not the best marker. It comes out a little too fast, um, but if you have a good paint marker, maybe put that in the comments so we know what brand you use. So if you're just practicing marking drones, you can let them go right away, it's no big deal. But if you're marking your queen, that paint is gonna be wet right after you put it on her. So you wanna make sure there's time for it to dry before you put her back in the colony or the worker bees are just gonna lick it off and clean her up and you'll come back next time and you'll have a, a, an unmarked queen again. Um, so we have these little queen cages that we put our freshly marked queen in so she can hang out there for a couple minutes before we put her back so the paint has time to dry. But if you're just practicing, it doesn't matter and you can let the drones go right away. To remove the workers who have gathered on the queen cage, you actually don't want to use your smoker. That's not best practice. You just want to gently flick them off using the backs of your fingernails, sort of one patch of bees at a time. This may seem scary, but we actually very rarely get stung doing this, so try not to worry about that too much. Always watch your queen go back down just to make sure that she's safe and you don't squish her. An important thing to remember when you're out in the bee yard um, is taking really good notes. Uh, no matter how much you think you're going to remember, as soon as you kind of leave the bee yard and, and go somewhere else and forget about it for a day or two, you come back and you, you definitely lost a bunch of information. So it's, it's great to have, you know, a kind of sturdy book that you can bring out with you. If you're really more tech savvy and you want to do it on your phone or a tablet, that, that works too. Um, we usually have a notebook just because, you know, your hands are sticky and dirty. It's, it's nicer to throw this in the back of the truck and fill it out. Um, but when it comes to note taking, really you, you can't give too much information. So really as much information as you think will be helpful um, is great. But things like, um, queen presence so if you go through a colony and you find a queen whether you find her directly or you find eggs um, how the brood looks giving it a rating based on strength um, anything that you notice that's pest or disease related is important and when you do your monitoring um, writing writing down the information from the monitoring in a notebook is great um, it's also good for helping with treatment so you know what time treatments went in um, and even if you don't think it's going to be all that useful kind of in the moment while you're taking those notes, it's really great to refer back to your notes later, um, depending on the time of the year. So for example, when you go through a yard and you've, you've seen which colonies have died and you're going through your dead outs and you know you have an idea of why you think it might have died, it's great to look at your notes from the from the fall and get an idea of, of maybe if you were right, you know, was, was that a colony that went into the winter really small and, and then you found it in the, in the spring and it was dead. Um, so all of that is important. Obviously, if you're taking it a step further and you're doing queen rearing, for example, the more notes you have, the better, because you have that information on how those colonies are doing from, from year to year. So make sure that you, um, you bring a notebook or something to take notes with and take detailed notes for all of your colonies each time you go through them.